All right, today we're going to talk about the principle of frame indifference, which is pretty darned important um, and probably one of those few moments of clarity and humility that human beings have had in our long existence where we realized that actually um, the laws of nature don't care whether we're watching them or not. <clears throat> and the way that we look at them really wouldn't have uh, anything to do with the outcome as long as we're not meddling with them. Well, that's even really consistent with, you know, quantum mechanical things, um, except that in quantum mechanics, you know, any measurement is messing with the state of the system because you got to go and touch things or mess with them to <clears throat> measure it. So, you know, it, it's still consistent with that. Uh, but in our nice classical mechanics world, then frame of difference certainly applies that no matter how we are spinning around and moving around as we watch this process that's taking place that we are forbidden from meddling with ourselves, it would uh, have to go exactly the same way because it doesn't care that we're watching. <clears throat> so this is chapter, um, I believe, 20 and 21 from the textbook. Let me make sure I'm not telling you a lie. It's one in the next set of 19 and 20 or 20 and 21. <clears throat> yep, 20 and 21. All right, so when I first went through, <clears throat> you know, this section of the book, when I took the class all those, well, not that many years ago, but not that few either, um, you know, it gave me some kind of trouble figuring out what the heck was going on right from the, the first page of chapter 20 there. And the reason it did was everything seemed freaking backwards, you know, because I'm used to thinking of a moving reference frame as like something that I, the observer, am in, <clears throat> and the translation and rotation are describing my motion relative to the background space or some other frame. And then, you know, the, the velocity that I observe would be minus my velocity and the rotation rate I observe would be minus my rotation rate. <coughs> and if you go through chapter 20, thinking about it that way, then um, all of your rotations are like, shouldn't this be Q transpose? And all of the offsets are minus. Um, and so what happens is they're describing the frame change in terms of how points fixed in one frame of reference would appear to move to an observer moving in the other one. So the observer's motion is actually the opposite of what they're giving for the formulas. So this is how a, so if we talk about F and F star, for instance, in chapter 20, <clears throat> then, um, you know, the, the expression that they give for X star is what the spatial point would look like it was doing to the observer in F star, as opposed to it describing the observer's motion. All right, so intrinsic to all of what we're doing is the assumption that there can be an inertial reference frame. And so we always describe the process in terms of that inertial reference frame. And then if we want to get the equations of motion in a non-inertial reference frame, we just do <clears throat> a coordinate transform because it's easier to do. So like I said before, um, it's a fundamental assumption of physics and continuum mechanics, especially, that the physical processes that are happening and the laws of physics have to be completely independent of the motion of any passive observer. And all observers must see the same thing happen 
even if it's rotated and translated relative to what someone else sees. So we're going to require that in our laws of motion, in our constitutive relations, they all have to be frame independent. So that, for instance, if all observers are given the same reference configuration picture on like a, a 3D equivalent of an index card, then if you ask them to calculate what the stress is or what the stress traction is, <coughs> we're going to require that they all get the same answer, you know, at least in the reference configuration. Um, in, in the spatial one, the force that they calculate might be rotated a little bit, but it would have to, you know, be rotated with their frame. <coughs> and so this would be called Galilean invariance that, you know, if you're watching it with a, a translation and a rotation, that the result is just <coughs> translated and rotated opposite you. And, um, you know, physical models <coughs> that aren't Galilean invariant, they pop up now and then, um, but they're pretty much abjectly useless for generalized use. Um, so it'll happen a lot in turbulence modeling, for instance, that someone will come up with a nice turbulence model that works for some ideal configuration or something that they've been trying to work on, but it won't be Galilean invariant. And so you really can't do anything else with it until someone else comes along and finds a way to translate whatever quantities they came up with to drive the turbulence model and they'll recast them in some Galilean invariant fashion. And then, you know, in that special case, they'll give the same result, but it'll also work <clears throat> if, for instance, you aren't doing it in a maybe vehicle fixed frame of reference. Maybe the vehicle moves in space instead. All right, so every frame of reference has an associated origin which that frame's observer perceives as fixed. So you might think of the origin in my frame as I'm looking straight out ahead of me at a point 100 yards out. <clears throat> well, in my frame, 100 yards ahead of me straight out is my fixed origin. But if I'm moving, you know, that's not necessarily fixed in inertial space. So the origin of one frame of reference can move relative to the other and relative to the inertial space. I'd said already, but um, I'll remind you again, that the reference configuration, while it lives in Euclidean space, you know, which <clears throat> is also where the deformed and spatial configuration, which are synonyms, live. Um, you know, so, so observers might see <clears throat> a different spatial configuration. They might be looking at it from different angles, but we're assuming in fact, specifying that everyone has the same reference configuration. And that's not really that hard to believe. It's like, you know, if you're watching some really big deformed blob go, like say it's a jello mold or something, well, as long as everyone knows how points in that go to points in their reference configuration, say you know it was initially a cube, then, you know, ev everyone can still calculate everything and it wouldn't do any benefit for people to have different reference configurations. <clears throat> so changes of frame refer only to the spatial configuration.
All right, so let's say that we have a frame F that has an origin O and spatial points X. Then we have a change of frame from F to F star <clears throat> defined by a translation Y and a rotation tensor Q so that a point X fixed in F is going to go to X star like this. So note here that the translation and the rotation are functions of time only. They're uniform throughout the space. All right, and this point X is fixed in F. <clears throat> it's not necessarily fixed in the material body. It's just a fixed point in the frame F. So that one would go to X star in F star is equal to Y of T plus Q of T times X minus the origin in F. <clears throat> All right, so, so here note, this is what I was talking about, how it's kind of backwards from <clears throat> the way that I'm used to looking at it, at least coming from an aerospace engineering background where we'd usually be talking about changes of frame and like system or vehicle dynamics. <clears throat> Maybe other people usually talk about it the other way. But to me, I usually think of the change of frame as describing the observer motion. So this is backwards from it. All right, well, since um, <clears throat> Q is a rotation, 
then omega equal q dot q transpose is skew. We showed that in chapter 3, I suppose. So q inverse is equal to q transpose. And then omega equal <coughs> q dot q transpose is skew. <coughs> All right, so for a point x that is fixed in the frame f, we have this. We have that the time derivative of x star, so how we see that point from the frame f star, is equal to y dot of t plus q dot of t x minus 0, or o the origin in f. And this is because <coughs> x and o are fixed in f. Otherwise, we would have to also differentiate x and o. <coughs> All right. Well, we can do a little bit of algebra here. And we have that x minus o is equal to Q transpose x star minus y. So what we did is we rearranged this one up here. And we're going to substitute that into here. So x star dot, its time derivative is equal to y dot <coughs> plus q dot q transpose x star minus y. <coughs> and that is equal to y dot plus, you know, omega. which is a skew symmetric tensor. Um, so, so omega, you know, which then has an axial vector that we might call little omega, is the local rotation rate of points fixed in the F frame observed in the F star frame. Since the reference configuration doesn't depend on the frame of reference, then material points and material vectors are necessarily invariant under changes in frame. They can't depend on how you're looking at the system. So like the offset between two points in the reference configuration is always going to be that.
Likewise, scalar fields like density, pressure, concentration of something, they also have to be invariant under change of frame. As long as we understand that we're talking about the same <coughs> material point and not the same point in space. And of course, since they have the reference configuration and in any frame it's assumed that you can come up with a correspondence between your spatial points and the reference configuration points for what the body occupies, then we're not losing anything assuming that, you know, we could talk about the pressure at the same material point looking at it from two different frames. And since scalars aren't directional quantities, you know, they're just a value, um, it shouldn't matter which frame you're in, you know, to see what the, the value of the density is, for instance. It's simply the density. <clears throat> So invariant is one type <coughs> of frame dependence, namely it doesn't change if frame changes. The next one that we're going to name is indifferent, which uh, a lot of useful vectors are frame indifferent. So in other words, the scalar field phi, which we're going to talk about in terms of points in the reference configuration, and t, if I look at it from a different <coughs> frame of reference and then, you know, make that correspondence between my new frame of reference, f star, and reference configuration points, then we have this. And we can describe it spatially as phi spatial x and t is equal to phi star of x star and t, where x star and x are related by this right here. All right, a vector field G is called frame indifferent <clears throat> if it just rotates with frame rotation. So things like the displacement between two points would be frame indifferent. The velocity would not be frame indifferent since uh, there's also the translation part. So in other words, G star, <coughs> that vector field as perceived from the F star frame is just equal to Q times G. 
the conventional body force, so say like gravity, behave this way. Um, you know, gravity, if we're in like this earth fixed frame, then it's always going to be down. <clears throat> but if I spin myself 90 degrees to the side, then, you know, the gravity frame from my perception just rotates with the rest of the earth around me as I spin. So we have that if B naught <coughs> is equal to rho G, the gravity force. Well, rho doesn't, you know, that's frame invariant because it's a scalar. So G, the gravitational acceleration, is going to be frame indifferent. It just rotates with the perceived motion of space. So B naught star is equal to Q B naught. <clears throat> so a tensor field is going to be called frame indifferent if it <clears throat> does something similar and we'll write that out here So that's going to be if it's given two frame indifferent vector fields, G and H, in F, the following holds. <clears throat> And they're going to satisfy H equals tensor G of G that's in the frame F, then H star, so H as we observe it in the F star frame, is equal to <coughs> G star g star again all right well since h is frame indifferent we have that h star is equal to q h so that is equal to q G tensor acting on G vector. <clears throat> that last part comes from right there. All right, well, G, since G is frame indifferent, we know that G star is QG. Well, then, we also know that G is Q transpose G star. So that is equal to Q G Q transpose G star. And that is equal to the tensor G star times the vector G star. <clears throat> so a frame indifferent tensor field is one that behaves under the change of frame as G star is equal to Q, G, Q, that should be a transpose there. 
not a star. Which is to say that it basically you're you're rotating what's it doing? It takes you know the, the new frame, the star frame vectors, it rotates them back to the original frame, applies G, and then rotates that to the starred frame. as g star is equal to q <coughs> g q transpose. All right, so if we have a fixed basis that rotates, you know, it, it's fixed in the frame f, <coughs> then in the frame f star, we're going to perceive it as rotating some if Q is not just the identity. <clears throat> and this will be an orthonormal basis. <clears throat> and we would have that E I star is equal to Q E I. <clears throat> so if G is a frame in different vector field. then g star is equal to g i star e i star, which is equal to q times g, because it's frame indifferent. Well, that's equal to q g i e i. We can move the scalar components g i outside of there, so that is equal to g i q e i, <coughs> which is equal to g i e i star. So g i star is equal to gi, which is to say that the components of a frame indifferent vector field, when expressed <coughs> with respect to a basis that moves with the frame f, the components will be the same in both f and f star. <coughs> And of course, that makes sense, right? If we're talking about background space here and we have an x and a y axis, um, then say you have the vector e x plus e y that's fixed in the inertial space. Well, if we're rotating, say, clockwise or something, e x and e y are going to rotate counterclockwise, um, but we're always going to see that vector as the same linear combination of that e x and e y. It'll just look like E, X, and E, Y are rotating in our frame. <clears throat> All right, so the same sort of thing is going to hold for the components of a frame in different tensor field. We have that G star is equal to G star 
i j e i star tensor e j star <coughs> and g is frame indifferent then we have that g star is equal to q g q transpose so that is equal to q g i j without the star e i tensor product e j q transpose and from our homework we remember that that is equal to g i j q e i tensor product q e j <coughs> which is equal to g i j e i star tensor product e j star so g i j star is equal to g i j so the components of frame in different fields when expressed with respect to a basis that rotates with the frame which is to say it's fixed in the original frame then those components are independent of the frame all right now let's start looking at frame independence or invariance and whatever else of all of our useful tensorial quantities involving the deformation gradient. So the deformation as we see it in the F star frame, which we'll call chi star of X and T is equal to, we're just going to apply our change of frame to what you would have seen in the, uh, F frame, so that is equal to y of t plus q of t times chi, the deformation as the frame F sees it, <coughs> of x and t minus o. All right, so if we take the gradient of all of that with respect to position in the reference configuration, that'll give us F star. Uh, well, this one is not dependent on space, and this is not dependent on space. So what do we have? We have that F <coughs> star is equal to the referential gradient of chi star. And that is equal to Q times the gradient of the F frames chi. All right, so we have that F star is equal to Q F. So we see that it doesn't transform as Q F Q transpose. So the deformation gradient is not frame indifferent, <coughs> nor is it invariant, right? F star is not equal to F. All right, now let's take the time derivative of chi and look at differentiating it. <coughs> chi star of our material points the time derivative of that is equal to y dot plus q chi dot plus q dot chi minus the origin in that frame. 
<coughs> and so what we have is that the time derivative of f star, and this is the material time derivative, that is equal to q f dot plus q dot f. So all we did was take the gradient of what was above. All right, well, the velocity in the new frame is v star of x star and t. That is equal to the time derivative of our deformation <coughs> as perceived there. And so we have that that is equal to q times v, the velocity in the f frame, plus y dot of t plus q dot x minus o. And so that's from uh, this right here. You can see that this would be your, you know, this gives you the spatial point, and this is the velocity, describing it in terms of <clears throat> material points, but you can just as easily describe it in terms of spatial points. All right, so then L star, the velocity gradient in the spatial configuration, now the gradient taken in F star. All right, well, one thing to note is that the gradient in the star configuration of fixed points in the, uh, the F configuration is just equal to the rotation. And so if we look at taking the gradient of v star with respect to x fixed, yeah, with respect to spatial, well, with respect to x in the f frame, So we have grad v star. <coughs> so this is going to be a little bit of an application of the chain rule is equal to grad star v star times grad star x. Well, that is equal to grad star v star acting on q. And so we have that the gradient of v star <coughs> is equal to l star Q, <clears throat> this right here being L star. And we can also differentiate 
the expression that we had for v star up above here. We're going to take the gradient of that. This is the gradient um, in the f frame. y dot plus q v plus v dot All right, so all of the Q's and Y's, their gradient is nothing. So we only have to worry about the gradient of V and the gradient of chi. So L star Q is equal to Q times L, the gradient of V, plus Q dot times the gradient of essentially x in the spatial configuration. And so that is going to be the gradient of x in the spatial configuration is 1. And so that is equal to q l <coughs> plus q dot. We can multiply, right multiply both sides by q transpose, which is equal to q inverse. And L star is equal to Q L Q transpose. That's not a very good looking L. But now it is plus Q dot Q transpose. And so that is equal to Q L Q transpose plus omega. So what we have is that the velocity gradient is not, that's not an equals, that's a plus. The velocity gradient is not frame indifferent um, because the frame spin induces some additional crap in there, specifically skew symmetric crap. All right, so, but we, we do see that it is, you know, this nice frame indifferent part plus a skew symmetric part. So when you take the symmetric part of it, you will get something that is frame indifferent. So the <clears throat> D star, I suppose that would be the stretching tensor is equal to sim. L star, well, that is equal to Q D Q transpose. W star is going to be the one that is not frame indifferent. That is skew. L star is equal to Q W Q transpose plus the frame spin. <coughs> All right, now we can look at the right Cauchy Green deformation tensor. C star is equal to F star transpose F star. We already showed how F transforms, it goes to QF in the star frame, so that is equal to the transpose of QF times QF. <coughs> well, that is equal to F transpose Q transpose QF. Well, Q is a rotation, so Q transpose Q is the identity, so that is F transpose F. 
which is equal to C. So the right Cauchy green deformation tensor C is invariant under a change in frame, which makes sense because it is a material tensor field. It maps material vectors, you know, in the reference configuration to material vectors. So it really necessarily cannot care about how we look at it because we said that the reference configuration doesn't care how we look at it. All right, so, so as a corollary of that, u, the right stretch tensor, which is equal to the square root of c, and e, the uh, green St. Venant strain, are both also invariant. <coughs> That's a bad U. Like the letter, not the not the baby goat. Sheep. That one. I suppose the baby goat is called a kid. The sheep's the one that's called the U. All right, so like I said, in general, tensors that map material vectors to material vectors are going to be invariant. Um, if you come up with a tensor that <coughs> maps material vectors to material vectors and is not invariant, uh, it's very likely that you've gone astray. All right, so now let's look at the left Cauchy Green deformation tensor, B. We're going to show that that is frame indifferent, which is to say that it just kind of, you know, rotates with the motion. Um, and that's going to make sense. Because that talks about the angles between, you know, how things got deformed when you look at it in the spatial configuration. So your whole space rotated, but the amount that it got squished didn't. F star, F star transpose is equal to Q F <coughs> Q F transpose. That is equal to Q F F transpose. Q transpose is equal to Q Q transpose. So the spatial measures of strain and deformation are frame indifferent. So that B star <coughs> is equal to Q B Q transpose. V is the square root of B. So V star is Q V <coughs> Q transpose. And also the stretching tensor, you know, the symmetric part of the velocity gradient. D star is equal to Q D Q transpose. The mixed tensor fields that either include or explicitly describe rotation of the body relative to the reference configuration are neither frame indifferent nor invariant because they include the frame rotation in them, 
so they can't just rotate against the frame because it's all mucked up in there. So we have F star <coughs> is equal to Q F R star is equal to Q R L star is equal to Q L Q transpose plus omega and W star is equal to Q W Q transpose plus omega are neither frame indifferent nor invariant. All right, so that was chapter 20. <clears throat> which is kind of one of the little more confusing -y ones. And we didn't hit everything in it. Um, you should read all of it. However, we're not really going to do much with like the co-variant and contravariant rate stuff that they have there. Um, but you should understand it because if you ever do research along these lines, you'll need it. Uh, but we're going to move on to chapter 21, which this will be a pretty quick coverage of that in a couple pages. That was a shorter chapter. Um, all right, so we said that a fundamental principle of physics is that the physical laws be independent of the frame of reference. <clears throat> so for us, that means that balance of mass, balance of linear and angular momentum, and in the next section, balance of energy, all have to be frame indifferent. You know, it, whatever way we look at it, the balance laws still need to be satisfied. So if we have this, um, you know, mid, well, spatial region P sub T convecting with the body that's observed from frame F, then balance of momentum has to apply from frame F or from F star. So we have... <clears throat> we're going to write out balance of linear momentum here using the, you know, Cauchy's theorem for the stress, you know, that it, that it is a tensor. And remember this B here is the generalized body force that includes inertia. And that is equal to vector zero. And this is for all PT convecting with the body. All right, so if we see that from F, we'd better also see that from F star. You know, so in F star, we might describe the position of everything differently. All right, we're going to take the, oh, stop that. Ooh. 
definitely didn't want that. Tell you what. All right, we'll try that again. No, that's not the one that we wanted. We wanted uh, this. All right. Well, I think I ended up not saving any time doing it that way, but that's all right. We use technology. <clears throat> All right, so if we talk about the same region that's convecting with the body, and we're just viewing it from F versus F star, so P sub T is equal to chi of P and T, and then P T star is equal to chi star, again, of p and t. Then let's uh, draw that. Maybe we'll bring that onto a new page since we're at the bottom of this one. Hey, that time it worked the first time. All right, so let's draw our little kidney bean region. That's what they drew in the book. I guess they weren't feeling very Irish. They drew a kidney bean instead of a potato. All right, so here it is in the F frame. And we have you know, P sub T. There's its boundary. Here's a point in the boundary. Here's the unit normal to that point. Well, to the surface at that point, you can't really have a normal to a point, can you? All right, and here is the traction N, X, and T. <clears throat> All right, well, we can take that whole thing and say we're viewing it from our new F star frame. Try to draw the same kidney bean as best I can. I think I did a pretty poor job of it, so we'll give it one more try. All right, that's about as good as it's going to get, so that's the way it looks. All right, so then this is P sub T star, and here's its boundary. And we'll draw the same points and everything. All right, so N's going to go. We rotated about 90 degrees, so it'll rotate about 90 degrees. Go a little south of east. And I suppose T will go about straight down. So this is X star. N hat star and T star of N star X star and T. It really took a long time to draw that to make not too much of a point, huh? Oh well, that's the way it goes. At any rate, um, you know, it, it would make sense that the surface traction here, 
and the surface traction here. You know, the, the force between the exterior world and PT at that point, uh, it really can't depend on the way that we look at it. So like T versus T star, that can only be the frame rotation being the change between them, you know. They have to be otherwise equal. So in other words, the surface traction force, and in fact also the normal vector, you know, they, they have to be frame indifferent. So you could actually prove um, that the normal is frame indifferent just based on this like transformation thing and the whole cofactor mess that we had done before. Maybe you should. That'd be a pretty good homework problem, wouldn't it? All right, so at any rate, um, we have that T star is equal to QT, which is to say that it just rotates with how we're perceiving space moving, and N star is equal to QN. Yeah, I gave them hats. We're not going to take their hats away. All right, well, in light of the whole Cauchy stress existing being a thing, um, then T star is equal to Q oh, we skipping a step there. Don't get ahead of ourselves. All right, so that is equal to T star N star uh, based on the existence of the Cauchy stress. You know, and, and so that is equal to T star Q N. <clears throat> right, so all that we've done is substitute this relationship here, which I've stipulated that you can prove. This one is more of a, it has to be the case because of physics. Um, you know, that the force can't depend on the way that you look at it. This one is geometry. All right. T star QN. Well, that is equal to Q T N. Um, and that is right here. So this is saying T N. All right, so what we have then is that T star Q is equal to Q T. So we can write multiply by Q transpose, which is Q inverse. And T star is equal to Q T Q transpose. So the Cauchy stress, the one that maps spatial normals to the spatial traction force, is frame indifferent. Got to capitalize that. Can you imagine? All right, let's integrate some stuff. That's what we get paid to do. Anyone can take a derivative. <clears throat> All right, so this integral, which um, is kind of half of our balance of linear, yep, linear momentum right there. Um, well, we can express that now as equal to the integral 
over the surface as we've seen it in the other reference frame of Q, T, Q transpose, Q, N, D, A, which is equal to the integral over the same of Q, T, N, D, A. <coughs> Q is constant, so we can move it out of the integral. That is equal to Q integral over the boundary in the original frame of T, N, D, A. Well, linear momentum is balanced in the original frame, so that is equal to minus Q integral over the body of V dV. And so what we have here then is, you know, since we're going to stipulate that linear momentum had darn well better be satisfied in the F star frame as well as the F frame, then this has to equal the integral over P star of B dV or rather be equal to negative that. So the integral, not over the boundary, over the volume, PT, B star, DV, that's the generalized body force. So again, that includes the inertia, Q, B, well, those are pretty close together there. Fix that. Leave room for the Holy Spirit, you know. All right, so volume, oh yeah, this is a star. Volume elements and in integration don't really care about the change of frame. So as long as we keep the correspondence between points the same, which is to say that we're talking about the, you know, P star is the same material points as these, but we're integrating in the spatial configuration. Well, the frames are only rotated, so the volume is the same. So it's only maybe a little bit of an abusive notation to say that the integral over the body, well, the, the region in the F frame of B star, the perceived force from the F star frame, associated with that point, minus Q B dV is equal to zero for all PT. So the localization theorem gives us that B star is equal to Q times B. So the generalized body force is frame indifferent. So not only is the conventional body force frame indifferent, but so is the inertial term. <clears throat> All right, that's all we got for now. Uh, I think we're going to have two more short lectures on the mechanics, and then we'll get through thermodynamics pretty quick and hit constitutive theory just in time for the end of the semester. Planning on having two more homeworks, um, probably be one real one and one short one. A couple people have asked about extra credit. Um, I think I'll just drop your lowest homework grade at this point. Um, and if any of you find that dropping your lowest homework rate isn't setting you up for a, a grade in the class that's going to be all right for you, then feel free to talk with me and we can come up with, you know, some sort of additional extra credit assignment or something. I'm not looking to kill you folks with work. Um, but I don't think that anyone is really in a position to get a particularly poor grade if we drop the lowest assignment. So... 
we'll figure it out. You know, I don't really want anyone who's done the work to get something south of a B minus. That's not really what we're about in grad school, especially if you get the material. All right. Have a good one. Catch you later.